Welcome to a 13 News Now special presentation, Gerald R. Ford, a legacy of service. Hello and welcome, I'm Mike Gooding and this is the Gerald R. Ford, the Navy's newest and next aircraft carrier named after the nation's 38th president. Over the next half hour, Andre Sr., Stephen Graves and I, along with our colleagues from WZZM TV in Grand Rapids, Michigan, will tell you all about Gerald R. Ford, the man and the ship. I think one of the things for the ownership for the crew is they're, they're at the uh, starting line for a lot of new ways of doing things on board a ship. But there's also a lot of old ways that have been worked, time proven. Uh, we've learned those lessons in blood and we're not going to let those fade away. So um, again, a great opportunity for the crew, um, but there's going to be a Ford way of doing things that's uniquely different than Nimitz just because of the way the ship is built. A new day is dawning for the Navy with the arrival of this new generation of aircraft carrier, the Gerald R. Ford, the first of its kind, first in its class, based upon the vessels which preceded it yet blazing its own trail. There's much testing to do and much to be learned along the way. Captain Rick McCormick says anything worth having is worth waiting for. All this stuff takes time. So in an ideal world where everything works right the first time, you go out there, it all works great, and you're kind of on timeline. If they go out there and it doesn't work quite right, they have to redesign, or maybe there's something that they can do that makes it a little better, um, and that will take time. The Ford is supposed to be fully operational in 2020. Current projections call for the ship's first overseas deployment in 2021 or 2022. Yeah, the crew can't wait. Oh, absolutely. We're definitely excited about bringing the ship to life. I think the whole crew, the whole crew is excited about that, uh, especially the aviation boats mates. You know, I have 628 sailors that just can't wait to get airplane on board the ship. Uh, a lot of people will cheer that day when we do get aircraft on board the ship. It, you know, it is very exciting. Um, I've been here, you know, when there was no paint, no anything. It was like virtually empty shell. So to see it from the construction phase to now, you know, it's, it's incredible what they did in a, in a short amount of time. It really is. After years of construction at Newport News, the Ford team now faces years of shakedown, training, and preparing for the day when they take their place as a forward deployed warfighter. It's amazing. A lot of this crew's been on board since 2013. Um, they've looked forward to this moment for quite a few years now. Uh, they've worked really hard and they're excited. They're excited about the commissioning and they're excited to go to the next step and get underway. Cars zip by the tiny four walls that contain Chickasaw Restaurant. But the small exterior contains a giant testament to durability. Okay, anything else? We have fried chicken, we have fish, we have shrimp. And frying up food for 50 years. Therefore, much of that time has been Linda Joyner. She's been helping make tasty favorites like the Big Chick Sandwich, which is a chicken breast, lettuce, and a slice of tomato between buns. That's one of our number one sellers around here. But Linda is not only a cook, she's also a supervisor, and as such, worries about paying her close to 40 person staff. All right, 1087, please pull around. And that means keeping a close eye on the one thing that brings in most of her business. Newport News Shipbuilding. She estimates that the shipyard is responsible for 50 to 60 percent of her customers, meaning the survival of her business and the people employed here depends on what happens less than two miles away from Chickasaw. If the shipyard goes on strike, that affects, like I said, whether they're going to come spend money or do they want to spend it at that time. While the shipyard has a steady flow of defense contract work with the building of aircraft carriers and submarines, employees have gone on strike three times, she says, in her 47-year history here. She got nervous after recently hearing rumblings from shipyard customers about the possibility of a now averted strike. For Chickasaw, we had to lay some employees off just like they did because we didn't have the hours to give them. Chickasaw is one of 8,000 small businesses on the peninsula. When you have a concentration of 18 or so percent of retail businesses, a lot of service industries, um, medical, all these kinds of things, when there is a blip um, that really impacts the little guy. Michael Coons, CEO of the Virginia Peninsula Chamber of Commerce, says those businesses employ an estimated 95 to 110,000 people. That's much more than the 20,000 people employed by Newport News Shipbuilding, but it does provide the bedrock for which everything feeds. And to truly understand the shipyard's web of influence, we had to Christopher Newport University to speak with Thomas Hall. 
those 20,000 people are spending more than would be the case if, if Newport News shipbuilding didn't exist here. He's an associate professor of finance and economics at the Lutner School of Business and studies how much money the shipyard generates and how their employees are spending their paychecks. It's around three and a half, four billion dollars of revenue that comes directly to Newport News through the, the employees in the shipyard. And spent directly in Newport News and the surrounding area. But imagine for a moment a city without a Newport News shipbuilding. 20,000 jobs gone. Billions of dollars used to spend at places like Chickasee Restaurant evaporate. If the shipyard were to close, the real estate situation near the shipyard would be devastating. But at this point, there is no need to be concerned. In fact, just the opposite. With the president's announcement that he wants a larger Navy fleet. Many other communities don't have that much long-term sort of funding backlog and stability. And with three carriers, you know, if you include the Ford not yet commissioned, with three carriers coming online. And perhaps no one enjoys hearing that more than Linda Joyner, the supervisor at Chickasee Restaurant. The traffic, thank God we're on the main highway there, you know, and then we have the churches. They have supporters too, you know, but still we do need them too. Her family and employees will keep working. Thank you. And the line of customers looking for the popular Big Chick Sandwich will remain steady. Gerald R. Ford, a legacy of service, continues next. It's pretty crazy, you know, being as young as I am and seeing all this stuff come to life. For Nick Sarconi, the Gerald R. Ford is more than a ship. In his short career so far, it's all he knows. Pretty much packed up my life when I was 19 years old and moved down here. Now at just 24 years old. The alumni sticker kind of shows, hey, this guy made it through. He says it's hard to believe his accomplishments have brought him to a point of service that will impact history. He says, I wake up and think I'm going to build freedom. His skills are now a part of building this state-of-the-art aircraft carrier. Sarconi works putting catapults in place to launch jets on the flight deck. You just, you know, you're coming here every day to, to help protect this nation. It really helps uh, get, you, get you through the day. Oh, it's a humongous responsibility, but it's a challenge that I was, uh, I, I welcome. And it's a challenge that's nothing new for David Batdorf. The Ford is his ninth carrier he's working on. These new ships, 78, 79. They'll surpass me now in my lifetime. Now as a supervisor, director of construction, he's seen it all working his way up the ranks. At one point, there can be more than 3,000 shipyard workers putting in blood, sweat, and tears. So he says this position is one he takes to heart. It's a, it's a legacy, really, to produce something that is so long-lasting and so strong and powerful. Uh, it's been a kind of a full circle of responsibility and growth in, in my career to be able to lead this excellent team. It's a team that rounds out with Ebonique Dixon. It has come a very, very long way. She sort of encompasses it all. As a Hampton Roads local and third generation shipyard worker, this work comes naturally. Just everything that needs paint on it, we do it. She says it still hasn't processed that her duty, something as simple as a paint job, is an integral part of leaving her mark on American history. This is an everyday job to me, so you still really don't think about it that way, but I mean, it actually is a first of its class. So come the commissioning of the Ford, it means more than a ceremony. It's a symbol of patriotism in their way. Yeah, I mean, I'm just excited to you know go out and watch the first jet take off the, the flight deck. Uh, it's not, oh, finally that ship's gone. It's never like that. The ship never goes away. It's always a part of your life. The Gerald R. Ford has most definitely had its share of growing pains at $12.9 billion. It is coming in almost two years late and 23% over budget. Still, as the most sophisticated warship ever imagined, it took time to get it right, its supporters say. And they say that the Ford will help warfighters do what they need to do, which is to fight and win the wars of tomorrow. This thing is going to be magic. Uh, uh, and it's going to take them a while to figure out how best to use it. Retired Rear Admiral Mike Grute and flew jets and commanded the USS Harry S. Truman. He's excited about this next generation aircraft carrier, the Gerald R. Ford, and how it will be a game changer in 21st century combat. 
they're going to find ways to make this thing truly more efficient. Uh, there's talks of being able to generate uh, instead of the normal 160, possibly up to 240 sorties during the normal uh, flying day. Uh, that is in and of itself is uh, is a great move forward in our mobile airport capability, strike capability that we bring to the Navy. So uh, uh, I'm very excited. Uh, do we need it? Boy, yeah, we need it now. However, the Ford arrives with some well-documented baggage, including its high price tag and later than hoped for delivery. Grudhausen blames lawmakers in Congress and a decade of continuing resolutions instead of proper long-term budgets. Uh, it would be 10 times easier to build ships of this type if we had a two-year budget or a four-year budget and quite frankly that's what slowed Ford down a couple of times was waiting for the next roll of the budget uh, uh, to keep the plans going. And the whole thing came down to well we need to be able to generate more sorties we need to be able to cut down on the number of folks aboard the ship because folks equals money. Retired Vice Admiral John Mozak was there in the early 2000s when the key decisions were made on what the Ford was going to be. He served as Commander, Naval Air Force Atlantic. Uh, at that time, we had a Secretary of Defense by the name of Don Rumsfeld. It was his second go-round as the Secretary of Defense, and he was pretty thorough and he was pretty focused on where it is he wanted to go. And he said, if you're going to design a new carrier, I want it to be transformational. And so it was with the Ford, different than anything that came before, able to generate a third more sorties with 25% less people. President Trump was critical of the Ford's electromagnetic aircraft launch system, EMALS. He said it's no good and it would take Albert Einstein to figure it out. But Mozak has faith in the system. EMALS is, has the ability to do what it is we need to do, and I think that's what's going to happen and perhaps 20 or 30 years from now we'll, somebody will have a discussion that says boy I'm glad those guys did that at least I hope that's a discussion because look at what we've done with it since then the system and the ship as a whole have at least one fan in first district congressman Rob Whitman who serves as chairman of the house sea power and projection forces subcommittee in a statement to 13 news now he said I am encouraged by the Ford's recent successful completion of acceptance trials and look forward to her commissioning in July she will be a vital asset to our fleet for decades to come especially as we build up to a force of 12 aircraft carriers. Before the Ford was ever delivered to the Navy, its infancy began here, straddled by this peninsula landmark. This crane that advertises Newport News shipbuilding is known as Big Blue. With the crane, that's someone that's watching as eyes to pretty much put this puzzle together. Renee Lewis started working below Big Blue just as work began on the Ford seven years ago. The way we work is that we work in bits and pieces. And although we may not have the final, although we know it's a boat that's going to happen, pretty much we have to piece it in such a way that everything comes together in synchronization. That means everything must come together perfectly. It is also, of course, necessary, especially when you get regular drop-ins from this woman. She is Susan Ford Bales, daughter of the 38th president, the carrier's namesake. The completion of the most advanced carrier in the fleet also marks the beginning of a new way all vessels will be assembled here at the shipyard. So the carrier building uh, back there that we're putting together for unit outfitting is it's got three bays of about 120 by 120 footprint. Uh, each of them has a 50 ton crane in it in order to lift things. When a chunk of the work is done on the John F. Kennedy currently being worked on in dry dock under Big Blue, the assembly process will take place in this new building, says Jeff Hummel, construction director for the carrier. What we find is working undercover is much more efficient, both from a, a personnel comfort as well as avoiding rain and, and slowdowns from a, a, a weather perspective. And it will get a lot of use too. Huntington Ingalls, the parent company of Newport News Shipbuilding, reports that they have a contract for the refueling and overhaul of the USS George Washington. And there's an advanced fabrication contract for the new enterprise as well. It's given us a really nice facility with all the cranes and, and, and services we need right there. The building in the foreground will focus on another shipyard specialty, submarines. The Navy gives us a 30-year shipbuilding plan. Okay, so we can plan for submarines 10 years from now. Lucas Hicks was recently promoted from director of facilities to vice president of construction for the Kennedy. He tells us that if there were any concerns that there wouldn't be enough work to keep the 20,000 people here busy, 
Consider that they have 12 Virginia class submarines in various stages of construction right now. In order to do that, we have to build facilities such as one behind us to prepare for the 30 year shipbuilding plan. And that is beneficial for the surrounding community, too, he said. The workers that are putting together the building do not work for the shipyard. They're contracted from the surrounding community and other states. Well, the growth here has been ridiculous. The fourth generation, 26 year employee of the shipyard dropped an interesting fact about powering the 550 acre facility. An essential element to keeping work going on the shipyard is electricity, which Dominion Energy has paid $35 million a year to keep going. And we have a pretty good relationship with Dominion Power. We're one of their biggest customers. All of that power will be needed for the new technology that will be used to build the next generation of carriers and submarines. The information that the deck plate needs to do their job was scattered all over thousands of drawings. 20 years ago, we would have done all our work off paper drawings, okay, and rulers and slide rules, and, and then we went to calculators, and then we went to computers, and uh, the ships are now built and designed, or completely designed in a three-dimensional product model. Paper is becoming more and more passe here, as the shipyard turns toward 3D technology, augmented reality, and laser scanning for planning to the construction of new Navy vessels. The new generation's into technology, right? They're not into, you know, paper and rulers and things like that. And Hicks believes that opens up a new world of opportunities for new types of jobs here at the shipyard. And you have to do what appeals to the new generation and where their skill set resides. The manpower of Hampton Roads powering the future of the Naval Fleet. You know, it's a sense of pride that you have, a sense that I can point to something and say, you know, I actually worked on it with my hands, my hands, and actually helped build something that's very important. This special presentation, Gerald R. Ford, A Legacy of Service, continues next. You're watching Gerald R. Ford, A Legacy of Service. The Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum is in downtown Grand Rapids, but just about anywhere you go in the area, you'll see the president's name. There's the Gerald R. Ford International Airport the Ford Federal Building, the Ford Fieldhouse at the Community College, one of the major highways, the Ford Freeway. The Boy Scout Council here is also named after Gerald Ford, where a young Jerry got his start in community service and never stopped. Gerald R. Ford grew up in Grand Rapids, met his wife and married in Grand Rapids, and raised his family here. It's also Gerald and Betty Ford's final resting place. They knew and they wanted to come back here. It was a special place for them. and in their hearts and they loved, both of them loved Grand Rapids and came back a lot in uh, the post-presidency. One, go. Whether it was the grand opening of a new building or to celebrate his birthday, President Ford never forgot his roots. President Ford loved Grand Rapids and Grand Rapids loved President Ford. Jerry Ford was a star athlete in high school and at the University of Michigan. He got his first taste of politics as a campaign volunteer. But during World War II, he enlisted in the Navy, where he was a decorated lieutenant commander of an aircraft carrier. Just before his death in 2006, Secretary of State Donald Rumsfeld visited President Ford at his California home to give him the news that an aircraft carrier would be named after him. President Ford was so delighted to have him and to know that was happening. It was just a month later that he passed away, so he knew that this was happening. He was just so pleased. Gerald Ford died on December 26, 2006, and the city went into mourning. Flowers, candles, cards, and signs covered the grounds outside his museum. His casket returned to Grand Rapids and was displayed at the museum for public viewing on January 2, 2007. More than 50,000 people waited in line in the cold. The people all night long is stretched for blocks, and the, the family members came over and shook hands and talked to people. It was all night long, thousands and thousands of people came over to share their respects and be part of this tribute to President Ford. At his funeral on January 3rd, dignitaries came to Grand Rapids from all over the country. Donald Rumsfeld spoke at the service, as did his good friend, President Jimmy Carter, who defeated President Ford, thanks in part to Ford's pardon of Richard Nixon. Just six months before his death, President Ford asked President Carter for a special favor. 
Well, I was very honored to come here, you know, for his funeral to give the main, main eulogy. President Ford has nieces and nephews who live in Grand Rapids, and the Ford children visit every year. Just last week, Susan Ford Bales was at her father's burial site to commemorate his 104th birthday. She's also the sponsor of the Gerald R. Ford and has been involved in every aspect of its planning and construction. This is a once in a lifetime experience. And I thought, why do I want to sit back and watch it from afar. Why not get in there and get involved, which is what my dad would have done. And is anxiously awaiting the commissioning of the Gerald R. Ford. But I really want to see her deployed. I really want to see her in action and not tied up to a pier. That's what I really want to see, and that's what I'm excited about. The motto of the ship is integrity at the helm, and how appropriate that is that a ship that's helping preserve our freedoms will be out there carrying President Ford's name. A celebration will be held here at the museum, and the community can watch the commissioning live on a jumbotron. It's just another way to honor the man who will always be so important to the people of Grand Rapids. And uh, he was there, and I s called him Mr. Ford. He said, call me Jerry. I said, call me Bill. <laughs> That's how we got started. Bill Whitehurst knew Gerald R. Ford. They served together in the house. Then something called Watergate happened. Well, what would you want people to know about the man, Gerald Ford? His uh, decency, um, right man, right time. Uh, we had this terrible scandal. Here's a man who comes in uh, who had been briefly as vice president, but a long career in the uh, House of Representatives. He was minority leader, head of his own party, and um, therefore someone who brought to the White House what was needed. Uh, restoration in the respect for the uh, presidency, and Gerald Ford did that. After the turmoil following Richard Nixon's resignation, the former Virginia 2nd District Representative Whitehurst says that Ford gave the country something it needed, just when it needed it the most. Uh, that was an ounce of pretense in Jerry Ford, none. Um, and uh, we all just had great respect for him. Uh, it's good to me, he put me on the Armed Services Committee, so I had a personal feeling for liking him. But I recall very well when he made his first uh, address to the, to, the, to, the, to the Congress. And he began by saying, I'm a Ford, not a Lincoln. And I love that statement because it meant that he, drawing an analogy between a couple of automobiles, one was very ritzy and one it's not. And that was Gerald Ford. There was nothing ritzy about him. Unlike now, with such a partisan divide in this nation, in his day, Ford was able to reach across the aisle. Whitehurst says, despite the unrest of Watergate, it was somehow a gentler time. There wasn't the deep partisanship there today. And I think Gerald Ford, for his part of it, contributed to it uh, in his leadership. So having this aircraft carrier named for him is certainly very much in order. Uh, he was very much a, an effective leader. The right man at the right time. That's what you want to carry to be right there at the right time. So what would the humble Ford think about having a 96,000 ton aircraft carrier named after himself? I think that he would be very modest about it, certainly. Uh, he would not think it was deserving. There's no way Gerald Ford would say, gosh, of course they should have named an aircraft carrier after me. There are all kinds of presidents they could have named it for. Um, but I think that he would be very grateful for it and uh, would wish the ship well uh, and those that serve on it. Gerald R. Ford, a man for his time and now an aircraft carrier that will serve the Navy and the nation for at least the next 50 years. She is a great source of pride to the men and women who built her and to the sailors who will operate her for decades to come. I'm Mike Gooding. Thanks for joining us. This has been Gerald R. Ford, a legacy of service, produced by 13 News Now.